The signs were meticulously prepared and placed by the front door, ready for the final act. I had spent the last couple of days ensuring they were just right. Now came the challenging part. Up the stairs, into the master bedroom, and I began dismantling the bed, carefully moving each piece downstairs and out onto the front lawn. Slats and bedclothes followed, forming a pile beside the mattress. The side rails, headboard, and footboard were next, swiftly taken outside. Checking my watch, it was 4.22, and I needed to hurry to finish by 5. The kitchen table was easier to handle, and I managed to maneuver it through the door and into the yard beside the bed. Finally, the throw rug from the living room was rolled up and added to the collection. With everything in place, I erected the signs, proud to see it was only 4.55, 10 minutes before my wife's expected arrival. Standing in the middle of the street, I surveyed my handiwork. The bed, kitchen table, and throw rug, three places where my wife and her lover had engaged in their illicit activities over the past six months. The signs, strategically placed and out of reach, bore clear messages. The largest sign in front of the furniture declared them free for the taking, no longer wanted in the house due to the stench of adultery and broken vows. Above the bed, a sign detailed the repeated betrayal of our marriage vows, emphasizing the recent tryst and lingering scent of their actions. Over the kitchen table, another sign revealed their rendezvous just before dinner was served. And above the throw rug, a sign highlighted their preference for activities my wife had always denied me. Each sign was accompanied by a photo, capturing the adulterous pair in their acts on the corresponding furniture. A fifth sign, slightly behind the table, exposed my wife's lover as her boss, Greg Allen of Mitchell, Price, and Allen Realty, married with three children, unaware of his actions soon becoming public knowledge. At 4.57, just in time, I surveyed the scene, noticing a group of neighbors already gathering to watch my actions. Several cars had stopped, and some individuals were on their cell phones, likely either calling friends to come see or the police to report public indecency. Casually waving to the growing crowd, I headed back into the house, closing the door behind me. At precisely 5.05 p.m., I spotted my wife's car turning the corner, immediately slowing down as she observed the gathering near our house. Slowly, she drove up to our shared home of the past decade, her gaze fixed on the sight of furniture and signs in our front yard, particularly the large photos of her and her boss, Greg Allen, captured in moments of passion. Even amidst the chatter of the bystanders, I heard her piercing scream of disbelief. Finally, her eyes met mine through the window, and we exchanged a moment of intense emotion. She appeared grief-stricken, tears streaming down her face, while I couldn't help but wonder why. After a brief pause, I turned away, drawing the curtains closed behind me. Chapter 2 To understand how my wife Sherry and I reached this heartbreaking moment, let me introduce myself. I'm Jack Meyer. Sherry and I met in college during our junior year, introduced by a mutual friend. From our first encounter, I was captivated by Sherry's charm. She may not have fit the conventional beauty standards, but her allure was undeniable. Standing at 5 feet 2 inches with captivating blue eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair, Sherry's petite yet perfectly proportioned body, with her 32B breasts and tiny waist, enchanted me. From the moment we met, I was determined to win her heart. Our relationship blossomed quickly, and within weeks, we became a couple. Just a month after meeting, we shared our first intimate moment, an experience unlike any other. Our love was consuming, and we reveled in exploring each other's bodies. While neither of us were inexperienced, our connection was profound, and every intimate moment was cherished. It was evident that we were deeply in love. After graduating, we tied the knot and settled into our first home, a condo in Van Nuys. Sherry pursued a career in real estate, obtaining her license and joining one of the area's prominent agencies, while I utilized my engineering degree to secure a position with an electronic manufacturing company. Life seemed perfect, filled with promise and love. For the next 13 years, Sherry and I enjoyed a wonderful life together. We started in our condo, and as our incomes grew, we purchased our dream home and began our family. Our daughter Shelby, now eight years old, was followed two years later by Ryan, who was now six. Sherry and I adored our children beyond measure, and our family was the center of our world. So, what went wrong? I wish I could provide a clear answer. 
I wish I could say I noticed the subtle signs indicating trouble, but I didn't. I was completely unaware, living in a bubble of love and trust with my wife. It took an unexpected incident to open my eyes to the truth, a twist of fate triggered by our daughter Shelby falling ill at school. One Thursday, during a staff meeting just before noon, I received a call from the school nurse informing me that Shelby had fallen ill with what seemed to be the flu. I immediately requested the nurse to contact my wife. However, the nurse informed me that Sherry was unavailable at her office and didn't answer her cell phone, so she reached out to me as it was urgent for Shelby to be picked up promptly. Apologizing to my colleagues, I rushed to Shelby's school, picked her up, and headed home. Upon opening the garage door, I was taken aback to see an unfamiliar car parked in my spot next to Sherry's car. Instantly, a lump formed in my throat, and my stomach churned with anxiety. No, it couldn't be, I reassured myself. My beloved wife couldn't be having an affair, it simply wasn't possible. Yet, why was there a strange car in the garage with the door down? Something felt amiss, and I needed to investigate discreetly without involving my daughter. Stay in the car for a moment, Shelby, I instructed her. But why? I want to go inside, she protested. I know, sweetheart, but I believe the exterminator is here spraying the house for bugs, and the spray could make you feel worse, I fibbed, uttering the first lie I'd ever told her. Let me check first, and then I'll come get you. Although Shelby grumbled, she settled back in the back seat, allowing me a moment to assess the situation without her presence. As quietly as possible, I tiptoed into the garage and used my key to enter the kitchen, desperately hoping to find my wife and one of her friends enjoying coffee at the kitchen table. However, the kitchen was empty when I turned the corner. Proceeding towards the living room, I hoped to see her engaged in conversation on the sofa, but it was also unoccupied. Then, I heard her laughter, that familiar girlish laughter emanating from upstairs, and my heart sank. The only rooms upstairs were the bedrooms. My knees trembled, and I felt nauseous, but I pressed on. As terrified as I was of what I might find, I needed to confront the truth. Cautiously, I ascended the stairs, the carpet muffling the sound of my footsteps. The first room I checked was my daughter's, empty with the bed neatly made. The second door led to my son's room, which was closed. As I reached to open it, I heard my wife's laughter again, echoing from further down the hall, the master's suite. My heart racing, I approached the door and listened intently. Initially, there was silence, then the creak of the bed against the wall, followed by my wife's voice. Oh God, Greg, that's amazing. Yes, baby, keep going, she exclaimed. Then, a male voice responded, You like that, Sherry? Yes, Greg, you know I do. It's incredible, just like I've told you, she replied. Not like your husband, Jack, huh? He asked between breaths as they continued. Please, don't call Jack that. He's not weak. He loves me, but he just can't satisfy me like you do, she confessed. My body went cold as I listened. My wife couldn't stand our lovemaking. I fought back the urge to vomit as bile rose in my throat. Although I knew my marriage was over at that moment, I needed visual confirmation of her infidelity. With a shattered heart, I slowly cracked the door open just a bit, enough to peek inside. What I witnessed extinguished any remaining love I held for her. She lay on the bed, legs spread wide, being pleasured by her boss, Greg Allen. My initial instinct was to storm in and confront him, but I realized it would only land me in trouble. He wasn't forcing her, she was willingly participating in their affair. As I stood there, paralyzed, he withdrew from her, his member glistening with her fluids. It wasn't any larger than mine, but evidently, he knew how to use it to satisfy her. Get on your hands and knees, he commanded, and she complied without hesitation. You know what's coming, don't you, Sherry? he asked. Yes, baby, you're going to fuck my ass, she replied. Whose ass is it, Sherry? Yours, Greg. Only yours. Never, ever anyone but yours. You took my virginity back there, and it's been only yours since that first time six months ago. Your husband doesn't get this ass, does he, Sherry? Oh God, no, Greg. I won't let him. I never have, and he wants it, but I tell him it's nasty, and I won't do it. 
But I get to fuck your ass, don't I, Sherry? Always, baby. Only you. It's yours, and only yours forever, I swear. With that, I watched, transfixed, as her boss guided his wetcock to my wife's ass and pushed it into her. A I E E E E, oh God, Greg, yes, she cried out as he penetrated her. Fuck me, baby, fuck me hard, fill me with your hot sperm. As he thrust into her, I turned away, quietly closed the door, and stumbled down the stairs, suppressing the bile rising in my throat, determined to keep it down. Somehow, I made it back to my car, closed the garage door, and started the engine, backing out of the driveway. Daddy, where are we going? I'm sick, I want to go to bed, Shelby said. I know, Shelby, but I was right. The things happening inside the house would make you even sicker than you are. I was only inside for a few minutes, and it made me sick, I explained, not entirely truthful, but not lying either. I'll take you to Grandma Sharon's house for a few hours until the stench goes away. It was a 15-minute drive to my mom's place, and my mind raced with turmoil. My marriage was irretrievably shattered, and I would never stay with the woman I saw a few minutes ago, betraying me in our bed. That woman. I pounded the steering wheel, tears streaming down my cheeks. Daddy, what's wrong? Shelby asked. Nothing, Shelby, I'm fine. Just the smell in the house really bothered me, got to me. I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm fine. I left Shelby with her grandmother, telling her I'd pick her up in a couple of hours. I didn't explain anything to my mom about what I had witnessed, just asked her to watch Shelby until I got back from work. I was tempted to drive back to my house and confront the cheating pair, but I knew I needed more than just a confrontation, I needed revenge. As I drove back to my office, I began to formulate plans that would bring ruin upon my wife and her boss forever. Chapter 3 The electronics company where I worked had multiple divisions, and I was a senior engineer in the medical equipment sector. We shared a large complex with another division focused on designing and building commercial security systems. Upon reaching my office, I instructed my secretary to ensure I wasn't disturbed for the remainder of the afternoon, then dialed my colleague in the security division. Dan Taylor, an exceptional engineer and a longtime friend since our college days, agreed to meet with me promptly as he was already headed my way to drop off some blueprints for copying. True to his word, Dan knocked on my door just 20 minutes after our phone conversation. What's going on, Jack? He asked as he entered. Come in, Dan, and close the door, I replied. You look like you've seen a ghost, he remarked. I might as well have. I caught my wife and her boss having sex in our house, on our bed. Damn, Jack, that's rough. I wish it were a joke. I had to pick up my daughter from school, and when I got back, there was a strange car in our garage. I sneaked in and found them together in our bedroom. I couldn't believe it, but it's true. Shit, Jack, nobody deserves that. What did you do when you found them? I didn't confront them. My daughter was sick, and I couldn't risk her seeing them, so I made her wait in the car. After seeing them, I quietly left and took Shelby to my mom's house. What's your plan now? I'm not entirely sure, but I know I need evidence. I need audio and video of them in the act, and that's where you come in. You need hidden cameras and microphones? Exactly. Something discreet that I can place in various rooms to capture everything. How can you be sure there will be a next time? Maybe it was a one-off occurrence. No chance, Dan. They mentioned they'd been at it regularly for the past six months. I don't know if they always meet at our house, but I'm willing to bet they do. Hotels leave trails, and his wife is usually at home, so my house is likely their go-to spot when I'm at work and the kids are at school. After discussing a bit more, we delved into the specifics. Dan mentioned he had access to a new line of wireless miniature cameras and microphones that could sync with my laptop or home computer. Additionally, he had a discreet, voice-activated recorder that I could place under Sherry's car seat to capture her conversations while driving. It would only capture her side, but it was better than nothing. I thanked him and arranged to pick up the equipment from his office the following day. Returning home that evening was the most challenging task I'd ever faced. 
I wasn't sure if I could confront my wife and pretend as though nothing had occurred. Deciding it was best to feign illness, which was partly true, I collected Shelby from my mom's place. Upon arriving home, I found Sherry preparing dinner in the kitchen. Upon seeing Shelby with me, she grew anxious. Where were you? And why didn't you call to inform me that Shelby was unwell? I just listened to the message from the school nurse on the answering machine. The school attempted to reach you, Sherry, but for some reason, you weren't reachable. They tried your office, but were informed you weren't there. Then they tried the home phone and left a message. They even tried your cell, but it went to voicemail. Oh God, I must have accidentally turned it off while showing houses. I didn't have a moment to myself all day. Sure, I thought, too preoccupied fucking your boss to care about your daughter's well-being. Sherry embraced Shelby and expressed her apologies before assisting her to bed. Despite being a total slut, my wife genuinely cared for her children. I appeared to be the obstacle to her happiness. Well, that was about to change, and soon. Sherry put Shelby to bed and returned to the kitchen to prepare soup for her and finish dinner for the rest of us. I'm not feeling well either, I informed her. I think I'll sleep in the guest room tonight, just in case I'm contagious. Sherry felt my forehead. You do feel a bit clammy, honey, and you look pale. Yeah, I thought, pale and clammy. That's what happens when you catch your wife fucking another man in your bed. I remained silent and proceeded to climb the stairs. I reluctantly entered the master suite, needing my shaving kit, toothbrush, and work clothes for the next day. A window was open, dissipating the scent of sex, and the bed was neatly made. She must have changed the sheets. It pained me to look at it. All I could envision was her boss fucking her in the ass while she declared it belonged to him alone forever. Anger surged inside me like a tidal wave, but I suppressed it. I had to remain composed until I could unleash hell upon both of them, and I would. That much was certain. I gathered the necessary items and retreated to the guest bedroom, closing the door behind me. Stripping down to my underwear, I climbed into bed. My body felt stiff and numb. Though tears threatened, I stifled them. I had a mission to accomplish, and I couldn't afford to let emotions interfere. For hours, I lay in the darkness, unable to sleep. Eventually, my wife entered the room after tending to the kids and putting them to bed. I pretended to be asleep as she checked my forehead with her hand before leaving and shutting the door behind her. Sherry usually took the kids to school, so I rose early, showered, and left the house before she woke up. It might have seemed odd to her, but I could simply attribute it to making up for lost time from feeling unwell the day before. At this point, I didn't care about her perceptions. I just wanted to escape. I had believed, until yesterday, that our marriage was founded on lifelong loyalty, honesty, and commitment. How tragically mistaken I was. Arriving at work before the office staff, I brewed a pot of coffee and began outlining my plans. I knew I had to cancel our joint credit cards, transfer half of our joint accounts to a bank under my name alone, update my will, life insurance, and 401k beneficiaries, removing Sherry and naming only Shelby and Ryan. It felt like so little to dissolve 13 years of my life. It should have been harder, and I suspected it would become more challenging at some point. I also recognized the need to find a competent divorce attorney to protect myself from Sherry's potential financial claims. While this was a no-fault divorce state where adultery wouldn't impact the financial settlement, it might aid in securing joint custody of the children. Despite Sherry's disregard for my importance, she was a good mother, and I didn't want to deprive her of her children. I simply sought joint custody to maintain my role in their lives. I struggled to avoid dwelling on our love life and the humiliation of hearing my wife extolling her lover's superiority over me in every aspect. Delving into those thoughts now would only lead to self-doubt, which I couldn't afford at the moment. That realization would come later, and when it did, it could potentially devastate me. Having finalized my list, I called Dan's office. He was available and assured me he would have everything I needed by noon. He even offered to accompany me to help install the equipment and ensure I understood its operation. Attempting to focus on clearing paperwork from my desk, my cell phone rang. Seeing it was Sherry, I answered after three rings. Her voice, once comforting, now stirred burning anger within me. 
Hi, how are you feeling? She asked with feigned concern. Still a bit queasy, I replied, masking the depth of my sickness. I'm worried about you, honey. You left so early this morning. I have a lot to attend to, I stated flatly. Let's pause for a moment. Subscribe to the channel and write your opinion in the comments. Let's continue the story. Please, take care of yourself. You and the kids mean everything to me. If only she knew how hollow her words sounded. I'll manage, I said curtly. If you're feeling up to it tonight, I have a way to make you feel better. I bid back my resentment. How could she act so casually after what I discovered? But I played along, biding my time. Sure, we'll see, I replied noncommittally. Wow, you must be really under the weather to turn down what's rightfully yours, she teased. Not disinterested, just preoccupied, I muttered, barely concealing my disdain. I'll be home by six. Call me if you need anything, she said before hanging up. That was my cue. I called Dan, who had everything prepared, and we met at the loading dock. We installed the equipment swiftly, placing cameras and microphones in strategic locations throughout the house. The master suite received special attention, with four cameras capturing every angle. We even installed devices in the master bathroom, anticipating their post coital activities. With motion activation and synchronized audio, everything was set. That night was excruciating. I couldn't feign illness again, so I followed her lead. After dinner and the kids' bedtime, I reluctantly joined her in our room. It wasn't lovemaking, it was a mechanical act. I nearly lost control when she praised my love, knowing she had pledged herself elsewhere. When I attempted something different, she protested, revealing her allegiance to her lover. She was a deceitful, faithless woman. After finishing, I turned away from Sherry, feigning sleep. She sensed something was amiss, as we usually cuddled afterward. Spooning against my back, she apologized, assuming she hadn't satisfied me. It's not you, Sherry, I reassured her. I sometimes wonder if I'm enough for you. She insisted I was her perfect lover and that her life revolved around me. Despite her assurances, doubt gnawed at me. What's wrong, Jack? She asked, concern evident in her voice. Just tired, I mumbled, shutting my eyes. Later, I heard her soft sobs. I felt no sympathy, only curiosity about her emotions. The next morning, I discreetly installed a voice recorder in her car and checked the recordings from the previous night, ensuring everything was captured accurately. Sherry woke up, initially irritable about our conversation the night before. But after a kiss on the cheek, her mood lifted, likely anticipating her rendezvous with her boss. I poured her coffee, and she mentioned her plans to show houses that afternoon, confident about a potential sale. With a kiss, I excused myself to my office. As I headed out, Sherry reminded me to say I love you every morning. I promised to remember, concealing my inner turmoil. How could I express love to someone who had betrayed me so deeply? Chapter 5 The information Sherry provided about showing homes all afternoon suggested she would likely spend time with her lover. I hoped for this, eager to end the charade and move on. In the morning, I managed to focus on work in my office, though I kept checking the time. At noon, I informed my secretary that I'd be away for a few hours and put my plan into action. I borrowed a company van and parked across from my house, waiting to see what unfolded. Around one o'clock, Sherry arrived, leaving the garage door open as she entered the house, signaling she was expecting someone. Ten minutes later, her lover arrived, driving the same car I'd seen during their previous encounter. He took my place in the garage, just as he had taken my place in my wife's life. I watched as he got out of the car and the garage door closed. They showed audacity by meeting in my house, in my bed, to carry out their affair. It only confirmed their belief they wouldn't be caught, or worse, their indifference to being caught. They would soon learn how wrong they were on both counts. With this final proof of my wife's infidelity and the impending visual evidence of their affair, I finally allowed myself to cry. For thirteen years, I believed my wife would never cheat on me, just as I would never cheat on her. Yet, doubts crept in. Was he truly a better lover? Physically, he wasn't any different from me. 
Maybe he was more attractive, though neither of us were remarkable. Why risk destroying our marriage and his own, knowing I'd exposed their affair to his wife? I yearned to confront them, but what good would it do? Catching them wouldn't change anything. I'd already done that once, unbeknownst to them. Would I feel better by confronting her lover? Perhaps momentarily, but it wasn't worth the risk of jail time. My concern was for my kids and his, as I was prepared to exact revenge on him as he had on me. Knowing that the evidence I needed was safely stored in my hard drive, I shut down the system and left the house without even bothering to check the mess I assumed was still present on our marriage bed. I had seen enough, and even though my heart was hardened against my wife, I still felt sick inside. That sickness was soon replaced by a burning anger and hatred. I think I actually smiled, knowing the hell I was about to unleash on both of their cheating heads. Returning to work, I filled Dan in on everything I had seen and heard. Like me, he couldn't understand how a wife as supposedly loving as Sherry could engage in the behavior that was now perfectly clear she was involved in. Not only had she shattered our sacred vows, but she had also gone out of her way to heap as much humiliation as possible on me in front of her lover, always making him feel superior and irreplaceable. She declared him to be the only one who could complete her and the only man who would ever engage in certain acts with her, acts she had vehemently rejected with me during our 13 years of marriage. These thoughts plunged my soul into a deep abyss of pain and despair, but I knew I had to climb out of it to finish my task of destroying both of them. Chapter 6 I needed to find a good divorce lawyer, and Dan suggested I contact the law firm the company used to see if they could recommend anyone. I spoke to one of the corporate lawyers I knew in the firm, and he gave me three names of divorce lawyers known for protecting husbands' rights. The first one I called was retiring and wasn't taking new clients, but the second one said he'd make time for me the next afternoon at 3. With that settled, I resolved to handle canceling credit cards, changing beneficiaries, and moving money around the next morning. When I got home that night, Sherry was in the kitchen preparing dinner while the kids did their homework in their rooms. She was wearing a yellow sundress and looked beautiful, and for a moment, I thought my heart would break all over again. She was smiling and seemed so happy, likely from her usual post-afternoon delight. Hey, baby, how's my man? I hope you had as good a day as I did, she said, causing my eyebrows to rise in surprise. My day was interesting. Not that good, really, but I did discover several interesting things I wasn't aware of. Why was yours so great? I asked, fully aware of the reason behind her good mood. I'm sure being thoroughly satisfied by the world's greatest lover will make your day. I made a sale, she said. First one this week, but I think there might be another one on Thursday when I show some more homes. I guess this must have been your lucky day, I replied with less than great enthusiasm. Anything else special about today? Meet any interesting or special people? I nodded silently in response. As I headed up to our bedroom to change clothes, I couldn't help but notice that the sheets had been changed and the room had been aired out. Upon returning to the kitchen, I casually mentioned the water on the shower floor. Did you shower sometime this afternoon? I asked. She visibly startled at my question and turned to me with a guilty expression. No, of course not, silly. Why would I do that? I don't know, but there's water on the shower floor and it never stays there more than a few hours, I replied. Oh, the drain is probably clogging up again, she quickly responded. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe someone is sneaking into the house to have a tryst with their lover and they shower after they've had a really good time, I remarked. She froze in place for a moment before continuing to prepare the salad without turning to face me. My Jack, you certainly have a vivid imagination, coming up with something like that, she said, attempting to laugh, though it sounded strained. I'll be in my office. Let me know when dinner is ready, I stated before leaving, noticing the worry in her expression. Dinner was quiet, with little conversation. I surprised Cherry by taking her usual place at the table and making her sit in my usual spot where she had been with her boss earlier. She looked puzzled but said nothing, merely pushing food around on her plate. During dinner, the kids talked about their day while Sherry and I listened, making occasional comments. After helping to clean the dishes, I returned to my office to work on my project. I carefully selected still frames from the footage of the day and downloaded them to create photographs. 
Then, I drafted the wording for signs to accompany the photographs. All that was left was to see my lawyer, organize my finances, and wait for the next visit from my wife and her lover. When I finally went to bed that night, Sherry appeared to be asleep, or at least pretended to be. I suspected that my actions had given her something to ponder. However, it didn't matter to me, there was nothing she could do or say to change my mind about divorcing her. Plus, I took some satisfaction in knowing that I had made her slightly nervous. With Thursday approaching, the day she mentioned making another sale, I anticipated it would also be the day I brought their affair to an end. The following morning, I once again rose early, took a shower, and left before Sherry woke up. With a busy day ahead, I wanted to maximize my time. My appointment with the lawyer wasn't until 3 p.m., so I had plenty of time to tackle financial matters. First, I visited HR to change the beneficiary on my life insurance and 401k from Sherry to Shelby and Ryan, receiving some puzzled looks from the woman assisting me. However, I didn't feel obliged to explain my actions to her or anyone else. Next, I canceled all our joint credit cards and obtained a new one in my name alone. Then, I headed to the bank to transfer half of the funds from our joint checking and savings accounts to another bank in my name. While I knew action regarding our home was necessary, I postponed it until consulting with my lawyer, as I anticipated the courts would likely allow Sherry to remain there with the kids. At three, I met with my lawyer, who struck me as amiable. He cautioned me about the state's no-fault divorce laws, explaining that Sherry could potentially gain custody of Shelby and Ryan, as well as the house and half of our assets, even with proof of her infidelity. Despite his reservations, I instructed him on how to draft the petition, confident that I could persuade Sherry to comply with my wishes. While he wasn't thrilled, he agreed to prepare the necessary documents, promising they'd be ready for service on Friday morning. Additionally, I had him prepare papers to file against Sherry's boss and his company for their role in destroying my marriage, also scheduled for Friday morning. With everything set, I felt prepared. Returning home that evening, I kept my distance from Sherry. I was fed up and eager to finalize the ordeal so I could move forward with my life. I knew there would be more pain and challenges ahead, but I was resolute in my decision, determined to share the suffering with my wife and her lover. After a subdued dinner with minimal conversation, I retreated to my space, where I printed the photos of the lovers for the posters and crafted the signs without interruption. I also took the time to compose a letter to Greg Allen's wife, enclosing four by five prints of the photos I intended to use on the posters, informing her of the video evidence I had in case she decided to pursue a divorce from her husband, mirroring my own actions with Sherry. Around 11 o'clock, I cautiously checked to ensure Sherry was asleep in our bedroom before heading to her car. Retrieving the voice-activated recorder from under her seat, I rewound it and listened. While there were several business-related calls, one conversation stood out, likely with Greg. Hi, lover. Thanks again for this afternoon. Me too. I always miss you after we're together. Yes, oh my God, would a whole week together be heaven? Yes, maybe we can before long. We can make up a real estate convention that we absolutely must attend. Laughter. You'll give me enough orgasms to drive me crazy. Laughter. Yes, baby, only you. You know if I didn't have to give Jack my pussy once in a while to keep him happy, it would be your exclusive property just like my ass. Yes, baby, we're on for Thursday afternoon. I can't wait either. Bye, baby. Surprisingly, her words didn't sting as much as they once did. Perhaps there was hope for me after all. Little did she know that she would soon be exclusively his forever. The knowledge that I was on the brink of shattering their lives filled me with a strange warmth. Revenge, I realized, was potent medicine. I replaced the tape with a new one and carefully positioned the recorder back under her seat, hoping it would capture evidence of her anguish the next day when her world crumbled. That night, sleep eluded me, not due to heartbreak, but because of my anticipation for what I hoped would unfold the next day. For the last time, I left the bed while Sherry slept soundly. As I gazed at the woman who had once been the love of my life, the mother of my children, I felt tears welling up. I knew this was the final time I would share a bed with her, make love to her, or dream of a future together. Our future had disintegrated, and as I walked away from her, I wondered if she comprehended the consequences of betraying me. She probably didn't, but she would soon face the harsh reality. 
After showering, I left the house, grabbed breakfast at a diner, and briefly stopped by work to inform my secretary of my absence. I called Dan to brief him on the impending events, received his well wishes, and ensured everything was set with my lawyer to serve my wife and Greg Allen the following day. Then, I phoned my wife to arrange picking up the kids from school. Since they had no school on Friday, my mom wanted them for the long weekend. I planned to swing by the house around 3.45 to gather their clothes and take them directly to my mom's. Sherry enthusiastically agreed, hinting at spending Saturday in bed, but her words rang hollow to me. I had reached a point where I couldn't tolerate her deceitful remarks any longer. I took my time returning home, arriving around 12.30 and parking discreetly around the corner, ready for the awaited moment. My car was strategically concealed, granting me a partial view of any vehicle entering my driveway. I didn't need visual confirmation of the garage door's movements. I knew my wife and her lover's routine all too well. At 12.50, Sherry's car entered the driveway, followed five minutes later by Greg Allen's. The trap was set, and I was poised to spring it. Despite the gravity of the situation, my wife and her boss indulging in passion in our marital bed while I waited nearby, I felt strangely detached. Sherry had lost her power to inflict pain on me. I remained surprisingly composed, mentally replaying the scenes I knew were unfolding inside my home. It felt like recalling a forgettable adult film, lacking substance but culminating in a dramatic climax. At ten minutes to three, Alan's car departed, followed shortly by Sherry's. Observing her retouching her lipstick as she drove away, I couldn't help but wonder how much of her previous lipstick now adorned Greg Allen's member. Once they were gone, I drove into the garage and closed the door, ready to execute my plan with haste. In my office, I reviewed the tape from the afternoon's rendezvous. The graphic scenes of intimacy, along with the demeaning remarks about Allen's superiority in satisfying her, were all captured. This time, however, their words failed to affect me. After ensuring the footage was securely saved, I spent the next 10 minutes carrying my homemade signs, featuring explicit photographs, upstairs, and placing them near the front door for easy access. I packed a toothbrush and some clothes for Shelby and Ryan, preparing for what lay ahead. At 3.15, I drove to their school, arriving just as the final bell rang. I informed them they'd be spending the weekend with Grandma, eliciting excitement from them. Forty-five minutes later, after dropping them off, I returned home and set my plan in motion. And thus, we come full circle, with the bed, table, and rug arranged on the lawn, adorned with incriminating signs, the neighbors as spectators, and Sherry arriving home to confront the horrifying truth, I knew everything. Chapter 7 That night, I didn't hear from Sherry as I had anticipated. There was a late call from her cell phone, but it was silent when I answered. An hour after Sherry's departure, the police arrived. While sympathetic, they insisted I remove the signs and photographs to avoid disturbing the peace and public indecency charges. Reluctantly, I complied. The visuals had served their purpose. They had pierced through Sherry's facade, plunging her into the depths of despair. That evening, I drowned my sorrows in a bottle of Maker's Mark, slipping into an alcoholic stupor. Despite waking up Friday morning with a splitting hangover, a sense of empowerment lingered. I had summoned the strength to channel my anger and exact revenge on my unfaithful wife and her despicable lover. Peering through the front window curtains around noon, I noticed the rug, kitchen table, and bed were gone, leaving only the mattress and stained sheets behind. I made a mental note to dispose of or incinerate them later. The morning passed without incident, but by three in the afternoon, chaos erupted. I knew Greg Adams' wife had received the letter and photographs that morning, and my lawyer informed me that both Sherry and Greg Adams, along with his partners, had been served at their workplaces. Witnessing the fallout, my lawyer recounted how Sherry broke down in tears upon receiving the news, while Greg Adams erupted in a rage, hurling threats and insults. His partners wasted no time in severing ties with him, citing corporate bylaws on morality and professional conduct. Simultaneously, Greg's wife phoned, informing him of her intent to file for divorce. Later, I learned from a colleague that Sherry lay sobbing on the office floor for a prolonged period after Greg's expulsion, abandoned by her former colleagues. Her whereabouts remained unknown, leaving a trail of devastation in her wake. The following day, I received a call from Sherry, her voice filled with distress. 
She inquired about the children's whereabouts and whether they knew about the situation. I assured her they were safe at my mother's place and that I wouldn't divulge any details to them. Grateful for my discretion, she then asked if she could retrieve some of her belongings. I agreed, offering to leave the house for a few hours to give her privacy. However, when she requested to talk, I hesitated, stating I had nothing to say to her, which prompted her to break down in tears once again. You must know I'm sorry, she pleaded. I never intended to hurt you, Jack. I couldn't suppress a bitter laugh. How can you claim to be sorry, Sherry? Did you expect me to congratulate both of you when I found out? I never wanted you to find out. I love you, Jack. You're the only one I've ever loved, she insisted. I find that hard to believe, Sherry. How could I, after hearing you tell your lover how much better he made you feel than I ever could? How he completed you in ways I never could? I countered. I have recordings of every word you said to him, every demeaning remark you made about me, your husband. Sherry gasped. I never said those things. How could you think I would say such things to him? Because I have the evidence, Sherry. I have videos of you with him, telling him how my attempts to satisfy you were pathetic, how my efforts were nothing compared to his, I explained. You claimed your body belonged exclusively to him, even denying me access to parts of you that you freely gave to him. I have it all, Sherry. There's nothing you can say to change how I feel. Jack, I love you. You have to believe me. I didn't mean any of it, she pleaded tearfully. So, you belittled me to boost his ego because his wife put him down? You thought it was acceptable to degrade me and betray our marriage to make him feel better about himself? I retorted incredulously. I never meant to hurt you, she repeated, her voice cracking with emotion. If you didn't mean any of it, then why did you do it and why let him engage in such acts with you, Sherry? Acts you always denied me? I questioned. I don't know, Jack. It just felt different and I wanted to be different with Greg. It was just about fun and excitement. I kept it separate from what I had with you, which was always loving and pure, she explained. You're truly disturbed, Sherry. I can't believe I didn't see it sooner. Shame on me for being so blind, I remarked. I don't love him, Jack, I love you. Please, if you can find it in your heart to give me a chance to make things right, I'll give you every part of me, Sherry pleaded desperately. I made a mistake, but it can't be the end for us. Let me prove it to you. I can come to you now and give you everything you want. Please, Jack, please don't leave me. Sorry, Sherry. I don't love you, and I don't have to leave you because you left me. Your actions with him and the hurtful things you said about me over the past six months prove you don't love me, I declared firmly. You can't love someone and wish them that kind of pain, harm, and humiliation. I think you're disgusting, Sherry, an evil and disgraceful person, and I can't wait to have you out of my life. Do you really think I want anything to do with you after what you've done? I wouldn't touch you if you were the last person on earth. The only reason I'll ever interact with you is because of our children, Shelby and Brian, whom you've also betrayed. I want to spare them as much pain as possible, but I don't want to spare you anything. I want you to feel all the pain you've caused me. You and your lover, Greg, both deserve it. Why did you tell his wife, Jack? That was unfair, Sherry interjected. Unfair? Are you delusional, Sherry? What you did to me and our children is unfair, I retorted. I told her because he destroyed my family by repeatedly betraying our marriage. He took possession of you, and his wife deserved to know what kind of person she's married to. What she does with that information is up to her. They have children, Jack, Sherry protested. So do I, Sherry, and my children are the ones I want to protect. I feel sympathy for his kids too, but it's not my fault if they may face a future without their dad. It's his fault and your fault, Sherry. I won't accept any blame here, I asserted. I don't want a divorce, Jack. I'll fight for our marriage, Sherry insisted. There's nothing left to fight for. I'd honestly rather be dead than be tied to you for the rest of my life, I replied. I know you still love me, Jack. You have to. You can't just turn off your feelings over one thing like this, she pleaded. You're delusional, Sherry. 
Did you even read the divorce papers you were served with? I asked. No, why should I? If you just listen to reason and give me a chance to make things right, there wouldn't be a divorce. If not for me, do it for Shelby and Ryan. They need both of us, Jack, she implored. They'll always have both of us, Sherry, but we won't be married or living together. If you had read the papers, you'd see that if you agree to joint custody, you can stay in the house and have half of our assets. But if you don't sign, I'll share the videos of you and your lover with everyone you know, I threatened. You wouldn't do that, Jack. You can't hate me that much, she protested. I can and I will. Fight me and I'll ruin your life. Yes, Sherry, I can hate you that much, I asserted. Please, Jack, don't do this, she pleaded. Sign the divorce papers, Sherry, I insisted. Please, let me make this right, she begged. No, sign the papers, Sherry, I repeated firmly and hung up. Sherry eventually signed the papers, and the divorce was finalized in six months. She now lives with our children in our former home, while I reside in a nearby condo. Despite the pain of the divorce, we both assure our children that we'll always be there for them. As for what Sherry told her family about the breakup, I'm not sure, but they still speak to me, indicating she likely didn't blame me. As far as my mother is concerned, it was simply something Sherry and I couldn't overcome. I had one final opportunity to retrieve the audio recorder from Sherry's car, and the voice track was unforgettable. She had called Greg on her way home and thanked him again for their afternoon together. However, she expressed concern that I might be growing suspicious and suggested they take a break for a couple of weeks until she felt it was safe to resume. Upon arriving home and seeing the people gathered in the street and the signs and photographs in our yard, her screams nearly broke the recorder. As she drove away, she sobbed and repeatedly asked, What did you do, Jack? What did you do? It seemed reality hit her like a bucket of ice water, and her cries changed to pleas for it all to go away. She called her lover and screamed, He knows, Greg. Jack knows everything, before breaking down in sobs. It's been over a year since the turmoil engulfed us, and slowly I'm starting to rebuild. I'm still not ready to date again, wary of the possibility of repeating past experiences. Shelby mentioned that her mom went on a date once, but came home in tears and hasn't dated since. Sherry found a job as a receptionist in a retirement village and has stepped back from real estate, at least for now. I haven't kept up with whether she remains in contact with Greg Allen, and frankly, I don't care. Greg Allen is divorced, and he struggled to find employment. Although I didn't share the videos of their encounters with anyone Sherry knew, I wasn't as lenient with Greg. Many businesses are hesitant to hire someone known for seducing married women and breaking up marriages. While I obscured Sherry's face in the videos, I left the audio intact. I recently heard that Greg's ex-wife is dating a nice policeman, and things seem to be going well for her. Regarding Greg's former company, they made a generous settlement offer to avoid negative publicity, which I accepted. As far as I'm concerned, it's all in the past now. My focus is on my children and their future. Perhaps one day, my own future will become a priority for me as well. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel not to miss new videos.